Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am honored to be joined by Mr. Luke Kondrich and Dominic Tancredi from Woodshed Stage Art. Welcome, guys. Good yeah, Bart. thank Good you, see yeah. you, man. Good, Good to be here. here. So just real quick to explain what we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is super cool because we're talking about the the technology behind bass drum art. And that that is your company, which we will talk about, does a lot of different things, but you guys make amazing bass drum art which there's tech behind that it started as painting went to stickers went to just different things but now 2023 you guys have some pretty serious technology so uh i, I said it before i love ideas like this so thank you guys for coming <laughs> coming up with yeah, this absolutely thing. man yeah great idea great Okay, so real quick, before we start, uh, people have probably gotten used to it. It's a great thing. Uh, we have another upper tier Patreon uh, member, uh, which really helps the show. There's so many of these now that it's, it's, it's turned into a thing that helps really support the show. So thank you to David Sagerton, JD Sagerton Custom Symbols. Now, David, I got to hang out with at the Chicago Drum Show. Uh, we, we literally had hibachi dinner together, and uh, <laughs> we both caught shrimp in our mouth um, at the hibachi <laughs> restaurant, That's which was super right cool. There. So. Uh, David does uh, custom symbols. The coolest thing is he heard about Nikki Moon's symbol camp on the podcast, signed up for it, and is now making custom symbols um, wow. because of that. So how cool is that? It's yeah, just like awesome. Awesome. incredible. All good guys, all good people. So check out D Sagerton, uh, D S A G U R T O N on Instagram to see what David is doing. And thank you, David, for signing up the upper tier of Patreon. So I'll let you jump in here. Um, First off, why don't you tell us just kind of a quick little rundown. We can talk about it more in full detail at the end, but about what you guys do to kind of give people sure. like, why, why do the, these guys know about this? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm a drummer first and foremost, and I started a business um, when I was uh, just out of high school, actually helping other drummers, other students of mine, I was um, teaching and I can, you know, go into the whole story behind that. But basically one of the things that put us on the map that we still do almost 25 years later is printing artwork onto bass drum heads and primarily band logos, but other artwork and things like that. And that's something that we've been doing um, for pretty much since day one. And the technology has come you know, a, quite a long way in just about 100 years, you know, Luke and I got to talking, you know, one day over some beers and we were talking about how the industry has changed in a lot of ways, but in a lot of other technology, drums are very similar to what they've been, you know, 50, 80, 90, 100 years yeah. ago. A lot of things are still happening, but, yeah. you know, the the totally. artwork that's on the bass drum heads has been something that always caught my eye, not just as a, as a you know, kid that always looked up to rock stars but also as an artist and as a guy that was always into graphic design that was a way to kind of blend those two worlds together and that was a way for me to know who the bands were when i was looking at them you know in concert or on mtv or you know in photos of modern drummer and all that kind of stuff and what gear they played and who they played with and all that stuff and luke and i just got to talking like over some beers one day about how the progression of the artwork changed with the technology of the printing that was available yeah. um you know going back to the 20s and all the hand painting all the way through what's you know what we're doing now in our shop you know like literally 100 feet away from where we're recording this episode right here in tropical cleveland yeah, Ohio. yeah cleveland. <laughs> right and just fellow Ohio. how far that's come yes. yeah yeah so you know yeah. and us being i mean like we're we're like literally a block away from the rock hall you oh, know cool. and getting to go there and getting to see the things that are hanging up on the walls at the rock hall and you know getting to see some of the heads that we're gonna you know talk a little bit about too about how the printing and the whole technology about putting your name on the drum head has changed but the fact that you know drummers and band leaders still want their name out there hasn't changed over the last hundred years it's just how you do it yeah. you know so we thought that might be you know something kind of cool to dive into for all the fellow drum nerds out there like us that you know get into all this stuff and maybe yeah. saw like the beatles head and saw the you know iconic ones that all of us uh, remember a little bit you know yeah yeah for sure i mean it's like it's like the the kind of classic like you know you like duh that's real estate to put the band name that's real exactly. estate to put the album logo where maybe before uh you know a hundred however many years ago when the drums weren't so uh commercial i guess i'd say you may they maybe didn't right. think about it but this has right. been like you said a hundred plus year endeavor um <laughs> to to yeah. put something on there that sticks that doesn't vibrate off that doesn't get ruined by the weather yes. so right. 
I'll let whoever, whichever one of you guys wants to start. I have some photos here that I'm going to be looking at and we'll do our best to yeah. explain yes. what we're looking at for folks who are just listening. Cause I know I've had feedback from people that say, Oh, I just wish I could see it. <laughs> These are on yeah. YouTube if you're listening, but we will do our best to explain, um, for just audio folks. So, uh, whoever yeah. wants to take it away, let's, let's hop in sure. and hear about this history. So I'll kick it off. Yeah. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is paint a little bit of a story with the technology as well as the the changing mindset that came with the real estate that is on a blank bass drum head. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you said, Bart, it's, duh, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. And as music changed, as culture changed, the attitudes towards how you utilized that real estate changed too. So we're going to kind of go through that and... Uh, hopefully paint a clear picture of how we capitalized on that and made it a whole new ecosystem for the right. modern music industry. So totally starting things off, got to pick to start somewhere. Um, pipe bands and bugle corps in the mid to late 1800s um, is kind of where we looked at where we think this modern design sort of started. Um, bands were performing and there wasn't much of a stage to perform on back then with crazy light shows and LED walls. So you had to have your name somewhere. And uh, bands started painting their name, where they're from, what their band name is, what year it is, onto the big bass drums that they were walking around with and hitting. And uh, it kind of became an art form in and of itself. They started hiring artists. And in this picture I, I sent you, Bart, you can see there's a million different. There's the National Newark one, there's Poughkeepsie, New York, there's the Drum Corp in Detroit, there's the Fife and Drum for the fire stations, police stations, like anywhere on there. And all these designs are super cool. They're colorful, yeah. they're vibrant, and they're painted on calfskin drum heads, yeah. which is a point that we'll get to in a minute here. But sure. we kind of think that this is where the modern part of design on bass drum had started yeah and you know just as uh, like an aside on this too these were pretty much done by you know like local sign painters that were also painting on the side of a building uh, this was yeah. a sign it was just a a like mobile sign that told everybody who you are and like where you're from it wasn't really artwork at the time it was just hand lettering hand painted like lettering you know done by you know a guy in in their local town you know and it was For it was sure. like a one-off thing you know it was it was Hey, these are my colors. I need it in blue and gold and uh, paint me some nice letters and yeah. go for it. You know, it's a yeah, one shot I mean, deal. That, you know? is, that is a job in itself, yeah. obviously, that, yep. but it's different than just like, oh, I'm an artist. I can illustrate things. It's like uh, there was a guy locally here and actually I think he was in Kentucky, but he worked in Cincinnati where it was. I followed on my, on Instagram and it's fascinating to see sign painting. I mean, right. oh, yeah, the, it's all coming it, it's back not, now, thankfully. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. But it's not easy. And it's and, and the spacing no. and, and and looking at these, I mean, we're looking at some of them, the, the dates that they have on here, 1881, 1938, mm -hmm. 1888 that are written on these bass drum heads. I imagine it's like old lead paint and things like that. And, and <laughs> right. The, right. It, yes. it had to be some <laughs> experimentation to get that to right. adhere correctly mm -hmm. uh, to the heads. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it, like you guys are just saying, old shops there were local people that were painting these things on windows mm -hmm. that had someone in the pipe band probably walked up to them were like can you paint this on a, a drum head for us real quick it's <laughs> on round what? <laughs> yeah it's on what now? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> right. so yeah. that's that's probably where things started and uh i would like to think that that picked up enough steam that by the 1920s other big drum bands brands were picking up on that trend and started selling these as an option in their catalogs. Yeah. So brands like Ludwig and Slingerland were doing this. And you can see in the catalog pictures here, there's landscape pictures. There's all sorts of stuff on here that is really cool. And you see these on like A and F drum sets now that are like old school vintage sort of aesthetic. And you could buy these in, you know, 1927 money, $12, I think. <laughs> We, we looked it up. It's two hundred ten dollars in right. today's money yeah. for a painted drum head. Yeah. And the cool thing about this kind of thing too is this kind of went from being a sign to being artwork and being something that like 
well, I don't know. I'm just a drummer. I just want something cool. I don't need the name of my band or where I'm from on there. I just want a really cool scene, yeah. you know? So they would hire like a, a local landscape painter to paint some cool landscape, you know, on these giant bass drums. I mean, we're, we're talking 26, 28 inch bass drums. So like you said, Bart, it was a blank canvas and, you totally. know, they probably studied from guys that were, you know, like marching uh, teachers, you know? So like the drumline guys yeah. would be teaching these guys how to play. This is, you know, one of the things that kind of brought it into, well, kind of now we're blending marching into a big band and into like stage bands. And now we're into artwork yeah. on bass drum has all of a sudden, instead of a band name or a, or a you know, group name, yeah. you know, we're getting into like just things that are just interesting and I just like yeah. it and I'm going to play with a bunch of different bands and it's something that I would hang on my wall because it's cool, you know? And I think, I think that totally. it was looked more as a piece of art than it right. was and a piece of advertisement. Right. Like the, the marching band, yeah. the pipe band stuff was like an advertisement. It's like, this is this is our name. This is who we are. This is a big bass drum. You can hear us and it looks great. And yeah. the other brands picked it up and started using it as a way to decorate the instrument. Right. Right. And it yes. was more of a, a decorative piece that surprisingly you'd, you'd hit, but I guess they didn't hit the bass drums that hard that back sure. then with those small pedals they had. But Still, yep. that's an oil painting or a lead painting on a calfskin head. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. it's crazy those things survived and looked as good as they did. But Absolutely. And it's, uh, you guys will probably refer to it, but also to remember that these bass drums typically had a light inside of them because of the calfskin yeah, right. head. And there'd yeah. be a light bulb and it'd be backlit for the painting, but the light would be used to heat up the calfskin head to stop the temperature changes. Yes. I would refer people to the Painted Heads episode with Jim Messina, which yeah. is the first 20 episodes or something like that, um, which is a very say. good one. Deep dive into that. But yes. um, it, these guys are artists. I mean, these right, are yeah. really cool. Yeah. And that's and, a real, yeah. I mean, that's a cool feature because that's something that brought that painting or that landscape to life on stage because it was backlit. It was kind of like a cool side effect, maybe like accidental. I mean, obviously, we use the, the light bulb to, you know, heat the casket up and all that good stuff but as a, as a cool side effect it also illuminated this beautiful graphic and made it a focal point on stage you yeah. know to the point that like luke mentioned you know like ludwig then had okay here's you know four or five different kind of styles that you could pick you know they weren't totally custom they weren't just like you know here's a painting of the everglades or my hometown pick one of these five and we'll paint it on your bass drum you know and that yeah. was something that became fairly commonplace and it was cool that they were backlit well maybe we'll talk about down the road when we get into like the leds but now we're doing sure. stuff now yeah like a hundred years later where they're we're doing some like led backlighting on the head so even that part's coming full circle totally. now but there yeah. was a there was a funny <laughs> moment in one of the pictures i found I, I ended up not using it but it's on the vintage drum forums website they have a whole bunch of cool archives of catalogs back then it was uh, uh an advertisement for these painted heads and it said, if you have an idea for a custom painting, write down the description of it and mail it to us. And then we will have our sales team quote the painting, write it back, and then mail wow. it back to you as a quote. And <laughs> Attach it on like the homing pigeon. Yeah. And, right? yeah, it's like, six months really later, you're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll right. do it. The, <laughs> like the Pony Express pulls into town with yeah. your yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I quit. I've quit playing the drums by this point. It's been a year. <laughs> right. I'm right. tired, man. I haven't played drums yeah. in years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. we're a little but, faster but, than that now, but yeah. I mean, that's crazy, worked. though. You'd say, like, I want my nude silhouette bass drum head, or I want my mm -hmm. bathing girl. I mean, there's some, like, interesting... <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the Ludwig ones. Right. It's, like, very, right. like... Uh, I guess at the time that would be pr provocative, but it's, like, yeah. um, right. I want pirouette and clown. It's... It's an interesting, right. um, some of them are very, like, there's jazz pirates. <laughs> there's just some yeah, interesting, right. it's, it's some interesting very, like, series. 1920s yeah, sort like the of aesthetic. And, yeah, right. yeah, flapper yeah, girls totally. going on with that. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, And there's yeah. a picture that we have there, too. It's the only one I could find online. It's a picture of an artist in one of the drum shops painting on these heads. Yeah. And he's got, like, six different size bass drums, and then he's painting onto the head itself. Yeah, and that's it's, the leady it's so factory. so crazy. Is that lady? Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. That's I'm sure you're factory. familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, well, just because that other episode, but I never noticed. There's like a hand back there that I've never noticed in the bottom corner, which is uh, interesting underneath the bass drum. So there's a mis mystery oh, person yeah. back there. But um, yeah, very cool. Very cool picture. And and I, as far as I know, that's one of the only photos, if not the only photo of this process being done. Um, yeah. 
out there. So This episode is brought to you by Blue Goose Classic Percussion. Blue Goose Classic Percussion has provided vintage drum restoration and sales online for over five years. They are pleased to announce that they will be opening Atlanta Drum Shop, a full-service drum destination in Atlanta this summer. Featuring new and used gear by all your favorite brands, vintage drums are their original and strongest passion, and they currently have hundreds of vintage sets in inventory. Some, but not all of the inventory is online. So if you're looking for something in particular, it's best to get in touch directly. They're opening to the public this summer, 2023. Join the mailing list to get updates at atlantadrumshop.com. Their social media is at Atlanta Drum Shop. And if you love vintage drums and cymbals, check out bluegoose.com. That's B L O O goose.com. And Blue Goose Classic Percussion on eBay. That's B L O O Goose Classic Percussion. So thank you to Blue Goose and Atlanta Drum Shop for sponsoring this episode. You know, and like you said, too, this is a job. I mean, it wasn't before this, it was, you know, like the local painter in town that was a sign painter. But now this became a job that a guy in, in the Leedy factory had that, you know, there were guys putting together you know like assembling drums and there were guys cutting the bearing edges all the other parts of the drum build but then there was a guy in this other department that was all day long eight to five painting drum heads all day long and he was painting the same five you know scenes every day and it was a grind yeah. like anybody else he had a bunch of time clock and there were no yeah. drum you know? heads back then <laughs> pictures of the factory like, right it was no. just a job it was just a no. job but you know i mean it's a cool job looking back but you know i mean you know, we're talking hours and hours and hours of labor that this incredible specialist artist had to do that if he was out sick that day for some reason or his wife had a baby that day, he was out of the shop, that thing wouldn't get painted. And it might yeah. take hours or days to get it right. And if he messed it up, he might have had to start all over. And, you yeah. know, there's a lot of, you know, for $12, I, mean, a, I know, you know, like minimum wage was different back then, but there was a no, lot. Of no. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder, and I think uh, I forget the name and the details, someone comment, but I remember watching something about Bob Ross where there's yeah. a style of painting where it's called like wet painting or something where mm -hmm. it's okay. right. it's a where, where he can produce a beautiful scenic oil or, or, or whatever it was acrylic or oil like painting in like 30 minutes. There's wow, some yeah. style okay. where it layers and it goes where I think I imagine these guys right. have some sort of technique that's like not paint by numbers, but where again, yeah. it's that Bob Ross. How did you do that? in right. 30 minutes. No they, mistakes. I, there's Only some style accidents. where it's. Yes, exactly. And there's little squirrels <laughs> all over and stuff. But I imagine it has that some sort of technique that it's 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 that wet painting. I think I'm getting that remotely yeah. correct. But who, who knows? That sounds so, about anyway. right. Yeah. And but, you pay them for yeah. the years, not the minutes. You know what I mean? Yeah. It obviously takes 20 years of, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? The practice totally, order to nail totally, it in, yes. in, a, in a half hour. So, absolutely. Yeah. And back to yeah. your point about the internal lights. Uh, there is a picture of a vintage kit with the uh, Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco on the bass drum. And it's backlit, and it looks sweet. And that's a it's San Francisco so drum nice. company kit too, which is actually yeah, like yeah. a reproduction, yeah, vintage repro. Yep, that's got to be a twenty-eight inch bass drum. But mm -hmm. like when you had that much blank real estate, of right. course you're going to have a big, you know, painting on there Seriously. to broadcast the artwork. But there was a catalog that we got from 1938. It's a Rogers catalog, and uh, it's selling the bass drum internal light for these shells. And, you know, when you think about it in modern times with electricity and all this stuff, you look at these cables <laughs> that are wound into a wooden shell that are lacquered yeah. with probably nitrocellulose yes. lacquer. That's a fire hazard. And LED light, <laughs> like yeah. lead paint, everything. Right. It's like, this is a fire hazard times 30. Mm -hmm. yes. No, yes. No fire codes back then. You yeah, know? no. no. <laughs> They're just keeping the head bass drums that lit on fire and i remember from <laughs> oh yeah uh the gene krupa story the movie which i did in a video with brooks tegler about what's wrong with that movie and it's all it's all incorrect but there was a scene where there was a light inside the bass drum that was triggered to the front door where the <laughs> the bouncer at the front door would trigger the light <laughs> in the bass drum to say hey the the you know the fuzz is here we're getting busted put your wow. drinks away prohibition so that's awesome pretty neat yeah, that is that's really cool. neat. But yeah, so cool. Yeah, back to that. That's that's how they were used back then. Is it was it was a way to decorate the drum head. There wasn't much in terms of advertisement that you'd be thinking in the modern way of like, what's my band name? What's my name? Who am I? Who are you? It's like yeah, this just, painting's yeah. really pretty. It's right. like hanging a, a painting on the wall of your house. It's, it's a like, scenic. Yeah, yeah, it's decoration. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And love it. That that definitely started the change 
into the 30s with big bands when people started to realize, wait, I can just advertise, I can put my band name on the drum head, we can paint it however we want, make it look however we want, and it would look sweet. And you just mentioned Gene Krupa. Gene Krupa was well known for that. He was one of the first guys to have the big shield on the bass drum head. And uh, there's a couple pictures that we have of Gene playing with Benny. And uh, the first one you can see, it's him with just the kick and the snare with a couple cymbals and a hi-hat. And it's got a huge shield on the front of it with BG instead mm-hmm. of GK. Yep. And that was what we think is the first where it was like, okay, well, this is the Benny Goodman band where he had BG on there to advertise that he's playing with this guy for this band. Right. And if not the first, it was probably the most like well-known for all of us, you know, that yeah uh, th- th- like at least like in my mind that's kind of the one that sticks out as now like the turning point back into like a signage uh piece instead of just like a decoration piece obviously you know B- benny goodman i bet didn't want to distract i mean he had a lot going on on stage with the big band and he was the headliner you know he was the front man he probably wanted you know yeah. something a little bit more subtle that you know, also said his name so that, you know, there was when he was first starting out, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of these big bands in every every town. And that was what you did on a Friday night. You, you know, it took your girl to the ballroom and you guys sure. went dancing. And, you know, he was kind of one of the first to really um, make a name for himself and start to tour. And this is, you know, this is kind of when you start getting in, you know, into like touring bands now. Right. And, you know, yeah. he needed obviously like a way to kind of you know, brand himself so that people would like remember who he was and they had such a great time and man, this this guy was on fire and his band was hot and they were tight and you know, that was a way yeah. for people in the in the crowd to remember who he was as they were dancing, you know, and the BG was what stuck yeah. out. And just that shield on, you know, obviously Gene being such a, you know, bombastic drummer that kind of, you know, maybe hogged the spotlight at times, you know, maybe he was putting it kind of mildly, but I think Benny Goodman probably had the idea where everybody's going to be looking at this guy anyway. I might as well put my name on his kick because sure. they're going to be looking at him anyway. And at least they're going to, they're going to have to notice my initials on this, on this kick drum. It's not going to be just a big white calfskin head. Yeah. It's a BG, yeah. you know, and then like later there's another photo that we have here two of the band uh, performing where the BG is bigger and off to the side, but we still see that um, shield, that vintage, you know, shield on the on the head. But now it's got the GK in it and it's got the GK alongside the BG. So now we're starting to see, you know, obviously Gene was, you know, probably at, at least for most people, you know, probably the first like well-known kind of rock star, star. drummer that people really, yes. yeah, yeah, star. Seriously. And he ate Household that up. Name, he, yeah. That was him, right? So he now he yeah. had his own his own fingerprint, you know, next to the next to the to the band leader's logo. So people also yeah. knew who he was. I'm sure he was because he's you know draw. probably angle. Yeah, yeah, he could draw. That's exactly it. He could draw. He could also, you know, he was also probably angling for some gigs on the side and is you know doing as much yeah. as he could. So he needed to get his name out there. So now we're also seeing where that kind of coexisted in a way that I'm sure Benny Goodman kind of allowed that to happen, kind of as a as a as a co-draw on that on that kick sure. drum head but we're still sure. you know hand painting lead paint on a kick drum on a calfskin kick drum head you know yeah. and yeah um yeah. but yeah i mean that was i think probably one of the first really like well-known bass drum heads in existence everything else was kind of part of the culture and we kind of didn't really pay that much attention to it but i think like the Benny Goodman and then like the BG with the GK. And then of course the one that had the shield only with the GK only. I think that's kind of, if, you yeah. know, if you pulled a hundred drummers and you said, what's the first bass drum head with artwork on it, they would probably say like the GK shield, yeah. you know, and that's yeah. the one that yeah. kind of sticks out, they're you different. know, like right. paint painted heads to me are like, that was a thing. That was its, its own, like, I don't know. It was the light inside and it served a purpose, which these may have had some, I guess you don't really see as much of a light later on with, with this stuff, uh, Mm -hmm. to be honest, once it gets into the thirties and forties, but the GK, the shield itself is just, I don't know who came up with using that shield design first. I mean, obviously we're talking about Gene, but like what artist and what person, Mm -hmm. but it is so cool. It is so it's awesome. iconic. It's, it's, yeah. it's iconic. Yeah. It's iconic with the yes. lines, the two lines. Yep. It's yeah. It it set the stage for literally just being used. I mean, people today still use it. Yes. Yeah. 
We still print those. Yeah, you still yes. print them. It's still kind of an yeah. homage, yes. homage back to to Gene. But um, so so just to clarify a little bit, you said that would have still just been a painted. Maybe they would yes. they would get a straight line and then and then yeah. just a really steady hand and paint that on there. Right. And you got to imagine, I mean, obviously these calfskin heads were very, you know, volatile. Obviously they were, you know, temperamental, but they also in other ways lasted a pretty long time. So you'd get a sign painter to paint this thing on there and it would last as long as the head lasted, you know, un until the thing untucked from the, from like the flesh hoop or whatever, or, un yeah. uh, you know, until you were in the weather where it, you know, split on you like or whatever but yeah you know it was basically just painted on there and mm. one of the downsides with obviously hand painting is you can't like replicate it every every painting is a one of one which made it cool yeah. obviously too but it had to be that's labor intensive a labor intensive sign yeah. painter that knew what he was doing knew how to paint onto drum heads could do one of one you know the next one he painted maybe like the gk was a little smaller a little more to the left a little higher you know the bg wasn't as big like you could never actually like duplicate it again even if you loved sure. it and even if you wanted to but that was one of the things that probably made it cool back then too because no one else could have it you know it was a unique yeah. piece yeah. of logo artwork too you know and, and speaking of longevity yep. there's a picture we got of gene's kit with the GK Shield yeah. and BG on it from the Smithsonian from wow. maybe five, six years ago. And it's the same head painted. You can see how worn and weathered it is. It looks like it's got a split in the head and mm -hmm. it's already come untucked, but it's still there. And that's, you know, 90 years later. Crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. And it looks great. That's so I, crazy. I bet yeah. they maybe, you know, on the road day after day, maybe got a little bit of like touch up paint here probably. and there because yeah. right. it would yeah. chip away or something because mm -hmm. they probably, the, the cases Flake were, off. yeah, but, but still <laughs> f after it got preserved and I bet like guys like Brooks Tegler, who was like, you know, writ literally written the textbook on Jean's gear can look at those emblem the, the the shields and say okay this one's this one this one i can date to oh, this yeah. right. year because right. of the the couple inch placement away from the <laughs> yeah. left side or something right amazing yeah it's like gary with uh ringo's beetle kits yes exactly like it's crazy exactly. amount of detail with picking which kit is which it's really impressive but yes yeah so and it looks like our, 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 everyone's, you know, uh, f favorite drummer to talk about, Buddy Rich, also used yeah. that same style. Yeah, and he was another one to take onto that shield. And obviously, when you think of shields, you think of Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich. Those two are it with that. <laughs> if you want to do that, you're probably in a big band and yeah. you want to have that going with your initials on it because it's, a, it's an homage, it's a tribute to the original pioneers who did it in the 1920s, yeah. 1930s, 1940s. It's also White classy. Yeah, yes. White Marine Pearl, yes. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's a must, right? Yeah. And it's oh, like, yeah, it's also something that's kind of subtle and kind of classy, and not you know, like we've got a lot of guys that that still ask for that now that like maybe aren't doing like the jazz thing, but they don't want like the Ginger Baker super super loud. My my name as big as I can on the head. They want a little hints of yeah. who they are and you know it's almost like the you know like the monogram on your cufflinks or something it's a you know yes. just a classy yes. thing to kind of tell you who you are but without screaming it you know but so it's, it's also a flex yeah. <laughs> when, you're, when, <laughs> right. you're, when you're the only person on stage that can stick your initials on something and it is big and it loud and round yes yeah it's a flex it so that's yeah. totally yeah, yeah, yeah. totally keep that in mind because that's how so that's how the yeah. mentality starts to change is it's it's no longer a decoration it's it's more like this looks classy, but I can put my name on here so people know who I am. Yeah. And that that kind of attitude started to bleed into rock and roll into the yeah. 50s. Right, right. Which takes us into the next era of this, which is the 50s with like Bill Haley and his comets. He had a really colorful, really cool calfskin head that he had painted that I think was on an album cover or two. We have a color picture that I think is from an album cover. It's a really cool picture. It's colorful. It's vibrant. And knowing how vibrant those guys were on stage, it only matches the energy that they brought to each and every show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the neat thing about this kind of era, too, is now we're also getting into not just like, you know, pop radio where it wasn't big band stuff anymore. We're getting into like the birth of rock and roll, but we're also getting into, you know, some big advancements in, you know, photography, early television. We're getting into like like rabid fan bases, you know what I mean? Where now touring artists could actually go on tour and have like rabid fans that knew who the band was and would follow them from town to town or yeah. couldn't wait to yeah. get a ticket to get into the, you know, into the, 
you know, ballroom to like watch him play or Elvis had a stampede Elvis, outside. Yeah. 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 And it was, <laughs> exactly. you know, we're, we're getting back into like that, that like band leader logo thing. But again, that was a way, you know, disc jockeys would obviously spin, you know, the albums that, you know, that were the popular things or that they got paid to spin, you know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> payola, like yeah. Alan Freed stuff. Payola, but that would, sure, yeah. that would basically fall into, you know, line with the, the shows that were happening in the in the town so now we're promoting artists on the radio that would then have a concert in every city and now you would start to connect the dots with the names you hear like the dj say over the radio with the artwork that's got the band name on the bass drum head you know and you got people that are snapping photos and you got yeah. you know photos in like newspapers that now you could tell who people were you could tell what the name of the artist now because of what they had on stage and their name is right there front yeah. and center that you know to bounce off that yeah there's back then there were no branded backdrops right there were no stage signs with like yeah. big light shows it was literally course, just sure. the band walking out into a theater a school auditorium yeah, yeah. A school yeah, auditorium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right yeah. right yeah. My old yeah. neighbor saw Elvis in 1957, and it was literally at her high school auditorium. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. It's crazy. Well, before and that, it would have been hotels. It would have right, been yeah, Gene right. at a hotel right. or something. Yeah. Ballroom so, or something. Yeah, ballroom. right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So it's it's crazy to picture that now. But that's, that's <laughs> all they had for advertising. So it's let's put our name on this because we bring it with us. It's literally no extra thing to carry because it's already something you're bringing anyways. And the neat thing was that it was, it was on the radio, and then it was on the poster and then it was you know in the newspaper and then it yep. was on stage right so people kind of got to see like the now we're talking about branding artists instead of branding products obviously product branding has been around you know yeah forever but yeah somewhere along the line you know these these managers got kind of smart and said hey we're gonna brand you you're you're a product we're gonna brand you like a product and we're gonna make sure that you've got you know name recognition and consistency and we want everybody to make sure that if they you know drag their friend to your show and their friend doesn't know who you are they're gonna remember you when they leave because you're gonna put on a great show but yeah. they're also gonna visually see your name the entire show and they're not gonna forget you and then yeah. they're also gonna see it again on the poster and in the newspaper and when you know yeah. when you're dancing on top of your upright bass. <laughs> right. Yeah. Next and, to the drummer. Who's the drummer. <laughs> the right. The logo. Band right there. Exactly. Yeah. It's all like, you know, impressions. Yeah. And I will add on to it that we're not just talking about, you know, this is happening in uh, Chattanooga or whatever. We're right. talking about in Europe as well, which we're going to yes. get to soon with, right. with, with right. the Beatles yes. and, and Ringo. Right. But they, right. I know uh, Bill Haley and the Comets famously did travel around England and the UK and Europe yep. mm -hmm. and spread the message of rock and roll. How does this yeah. progress into, because I'm looking at the next photo, which has a very cool picture of Ringo, where he seems to yeah. have written Ringo Starr which could have been mm -hmm. with paint, could have been with like, I mean, we've, we've always seen people use like, you could use tape, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's right. interesting. So yeah, yeah, how does it progress from was, there? When was that invented? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> this one looks like <laughs> yeah. a painted one on there Wikipedia. too. Wikipedia. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, his you know. premiere kit, yeah. Yes, so as, as you just said, a lot of the American rock and roll bled into British music in the late 1950s. And bands like the Beatles, well, before they were the Beatles, but bands in Liverpool at that time took notice. And particularly a drummer happens to go by the name of Ringo Starr, saw drummers with their name on the bass drum head. And while he was playing with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, he slapped his name on his premiere kit to make himself known in the local music circuit. And obviously that worked because when the Beatles were yeah. trying to record in 1962 and they were looking for a new drummer, who do they call up? They call up the guy who's got the name on his drum head in a band that they've seen before that held it down right and then yeah. i mean that's yeah. exactly like kind of the heart of everything because because he had his name on his bass drum everyone remembered who he was obviously he was good obviously you know he had the right look all those boxes were checked but you know it's like even now like how many i mean you know we go to see lots of bands you probably do as well too and like how many great opening bands do you see that you never knew who they were and you're just like wow i didn't come to see these guys but man that yeah. was such a great show and then afterwards after like at the you know like when we're at How like waffle called? house you know for breakfast hey what was the name of that band again yeah. wasn't it you know and like yeah we forget and then yeah, they're like, not memorable yeah. yeah and you know somebody saw ringo with his name on the bass drum and he you know checked all the boxes and you visually remember things you know more than just hearing it or more yeah. than just you know seeing you know That's something true. kind of a couple of times you're watching it and your mind is kind of like 
storing that in your in your memory as you're watching him play you're you're seeing the caption on the bass drum that says ringo star ringo star yeah. ringo star yeah. ringo star yeah and, and this looks like and he yeah. called him <laughs> and this this looks like more of like one of us could grab a bass drum head yeah. and a little thing of black paint this is less he probably like, did it himself yes. right Sign it looks kind of like a diy yes yes yeah. the o is filled in he didn't leave the space right. in the r uh, which is just, it's funny. And it's, it's crazy. It's like it's all off capital, center the tiny and little kind of sideways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, he, yeah. He probably did it himself. He probably, you know, maybe had a buddy that was in art class in like high school. Hey, can you, you know, can I give you, you know, five bucks or whatever, you know, do this, or whatever. But yeah, it yeah. wasn't a professional thing. But I think now you're starting to see, you know, like younger people start to copy the idols that they look up to and say, well, he's got his thing. I I need to have my That's name sweet. on it. I love that. idea. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, and I was a kid, I was doing the same thing too. Like I'd be, you know, thumbing through like modern drummer and I wanted to set up Blake Neal and I wanted to have, you know, like all the symbols in the, in the right way, like everybody else that I was looking at, or I wanted to have all the same heads as, you know, whoever I was looking up to. And yeah. that was another thing that he probably just kind of DIY'd. And later yeah. on, obviously like the Beatles head became probably the most iconic Sure. Bass drum head in the history of Change, rock music, changed but everything, right? Yeah. But that, this <laughs> yeah. is kind of this was cool for me to kind of see too, because this was kind of the the precursor to that. And then we see yeah. another photo here too of a of an earlier Beatles head from England that was a totally different logo. Yeah, totally not the one that everyone kind of you know like remembers. It's uh, it was when they were leaning into the bug pun part of the Beatles right. and not the yeah. beat part of the Beatles. And this yes. is like the early like an early logo with with the B in the shape of a, of a, a beetle, bug, like a beetle. A bug. Yeah. yeah. Like antenna. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And this wasn't even painted on the calfskin head. This was on a, a felt strip that was over top of the calfskin head, but under the hoop. Yeah. So it was kind of like an afterthought. It feels yeah. like, or maybe they didn't Slapping think they'd be a lot like, like around long enough to paint on the head. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was yeah. just like a temporary, like removable <laughs> thing for the, I don't know the history of this one, but yeah, you it know what I mean? It it's not permanent. It did, yeah, the, it job. did the job. Yeah. We see yes. it. And you know, and it's just funny too, to, we will move forward, but to mention that we talked about the silly kind of DIY Ringo star, head that uh -huh. he did himself that's probably worth if it's around more than all of our houses oh combined my and we're, so <laughs> yeah. Let's we need yeah, to respect right. the head but absolutely um, it was yeah. a precursor so, yeah uh all right then we have the felt one to kind of move forward here then we get to the famous the yes. ed sullivan you know yes. ivor yes. arbiter drum city let's talk about that so the thing with this one is it just kind of happened by happenstance and the the story very quickly is ringo was ordering the new Black Diamond Pearl kit or Black Oyster Pearl that he got. Black Oyster Pearl, Pearl that's very important. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. he's ordering it from Drum City in London. And he was like, well, I need my name painted on here. And it, the logo was literally just a quick sketch that then got painted onto the head. And it was like, all right, just do this. And it was like no thought put into it. Could you imagine how much money you would charge a design team now to have a logo done for a band like the Beatles? It's like the Nike Swoosh. And it was like, it's like yeah, the iconic, like it's yeah. iconic. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but that they charged, I think, the, what is the Nike Swoosh? They paid her like 50 bucks or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's like which, five pounds for Rio right. to yeah. do this Beatles logo. Five yeah. British pounds back then. Wow. And that made its premiere on the Ed Sullivan show. And even the numbers I'm about to read to you from the people that watch that today are still staggering. Yeah. 73 million people watched the show at one time in 1964 and there were 700 people in the studio which is still a lot of people in, in a live studio that nowadays that's like a, that's a small small club large large <laughs> club small theater yeah 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 but 50,000 requests for seats to see them at the show for 700 seats, wow. 50,000. Wow. Right. And that was because they were already had such a big following in England. Obviously, you know, um, Ed got kind of like wind of them when he was overseas and he saw firsthand all like, again, like all the like rabid fans and that they had a following. And, you know, he said, I have to get these guys in the show. These, these guys are massive over here, they're gonna come to America, they're gonna be big, we need to have them on the show. But he saw firsthand that they had a name recognition that, you know, I think, you know, obviously all the DJ stuff that we talked about, but that brand recognition they also had at the time in England, they weren't here really yet, but they had a, a very yeah. strong brand yeah. presence over there and word was already getting out, they already had the- The single leaked early. Right, and so they were already- They were like exactly. chopping at the bit to see yes, the band. exactly. So mm. by that point, 45.3% yeah. of households with the TV watched the show at the same time. 
and 60% of all American televisions tuned into the show. 60%? 60% of all Jeez. TVs in the United States. Oh, my in God. In 1964. Wow. Like, that that kind of exposure is incredible. Right. And my obviously, God, yeah. it's, it's the most spoken about thing ever, how much Ringo has changed the game for drummers. But how many millions upon millions of people who play drums have been inspired from that point forward mm-hmm. because they saw the four guys on a stage, no other branding other than the name on the bass drum. Yes. Right? And, Ludwig. Pan- L- and Ludwig. And Ludwig. And Ludwig. Right. Yeah. Yes. Thankfully yeah, they it's did not that. Even, it's not right. even a decal. It's a no, hand-painted it's yeah. Ludwig. It looks kind of like it, but and you'll, you'll see in the picture, it's like close, but not exactly how they had it yeah. when you bought one from any other store with a sticker on it. And also yeah. it was... It, you know, in the the hand painted version, it's a little bit larger than the decal would have been too, which yeah. I think definitely obviously helped them too because on the on the show, you know what I mean. They didn't really have you know close ups all the time of that, but being able to like read the Ludwig logo and and like recognize it, if it was a tiny little decal, you might not have been able. You're to You're watching that, it on a tube TV that's as right. big as our laptop. You're no. not going to be able to see yeah. it unless right. it's huge on there. So, but it was, that was like definitely be- intentional. It would be like behind someone's head. Behind exactly. Paul right George's over head. to, yes. Yeah, yes. John. Yeah. 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 So that obviously changed everything. And it's easy to say that the floodgates opened after that because every band from the 60s after that started throwing their name on there. We have a lot of pictures to show you uh, for that. But like, first one is Mickey Dolan's from the Monkees. That's a hand painted logo on there. He had a red one too, but Monkees logo in black. Keith Moon had the crazy, the Who yellow logo busting out of the head on there on his premiere kit. Yep. Ginger had a couple different heads. We have a few pictures of him on there, but Ginger, his silver sparkle kit with cream, he had two different drum heads with different designs on it. One was like the foam, the cream foam top from the first album. Yep. And hand painted, colorful, vibrant, instantly recognizable. Same thing with this picture from Chicago. Hand painted Chicago logo. Drummer Danny's got his name at the bottom. Yeah. Slingerland's up top. It's like instantly it became a thing to have your name on there in your logo. And all of these, point being, were hand painted. Everything was done yes. by hand back then because that's all they had. That's all you could that's, do. But like the cool yeah. thing was like, you know, obviously like the Beatles, you know, inspired. You know, countless musicians. I mean, everybody, even, you know, even guys that wanted to play guitar, wanted to play bass, they made it look easy and they made it look cool, right? And, you know, it was accessible. But so then, you know, how many millions of kids started a band like the next day? You know, you had all these high school bands that, you know, it was used to be this like pro thing before and it was kind of like inaccessible. But then like the Beatles made it like, hey, they we can do this. Come on. You know, so then every every kid with it, you know, just a little ounce of talent had a band. But you weren't a real band unless you had a band name and you weren't a real band unless you had a band name painted on the bass drum like that made yeah. you legit that that made it official and i think because of all these big guys you know cream and who and all these guys they saw all the popular bands you know that had any kind of presence they all had it painted it was like you couldn't you couldn't bring up woodshed stage art in order a backdrop yeah, yeah that didn't was, exist back it didn't then. exist back you, then the only right. advertising you had back then right. was putting your name on the bass drum and even the yeah. high school kids said we're not legit unless we have it too it was yeah. kind of your way to you know what i mean be cool yeah totally they're true you know? they're not cool or legit without that head. <laughs> yes. right it's a fact not right. cool at right. all yeah it's not objective. cool <laughs> no uh but looking ahead a little bit we've got the warlocks early grateful dead yes uh, 1966 that, that looks more like the earlier like kind of like just attached on sort of thing kind of like the I felt think- that yeah, I think what what they did there is they tried to do what Ringo did with the premiere kit. It's it looks like a felt strip, but instead of t- tucking it under the bass drum hoop, he had it over. Yeah, right? so it's like hanging in front of the bass drum head, but it literally is so just like warlocks, right. like drawn out. Probably took him ten minutes to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the only name you get of the band in the picture on stage. There, that's it. It's like who yeah. are they? Oh, they're the warlocks, mm-hmm. which then yeah. became the Grateful Dead. Right. But totally. there's also a picture of Cream with Ginger Baker when he had Ginger on one bass drum head and Baker on the other, as if he couldn't get his name any <laughs> yeah. louder. <laughs> Talk about flex. That's yeah, not seriously. like and that's, Ginger that's the ultimate flex. Baker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's that was done. A cool little tidbit about that picture is it's got Drum City's logo at the oh, bottom. Yeah. 
from London, which is when Ringo did hit where he got his drum set from. So most likely it's probably the same artist that did it. And again, it's a unique but not perfectly correct Ludwig logo on top, totally. really big. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was all it was all hand done back then, but creative floodgates opened. It was like, how can we get our name out there as big and as bold as possible? Yeah. And you'll notice other than Ginger's colorful kit with the the blue and the foam cream heads, most of these logos are like one or two colors and they're yeah. big black and white mm-hmm. in your face. Many cameras back then were black and white film cameras. So it really, didn't ma- yeah, it didn't matter if it, it was didn't color. matter. So, <laughs> yeah, right. really. No one saw it in color. Yeah, unless you were live, you know. Yeah. And, no, and, and the the risk of all this, though, is if you're not in, you know, the who or the Grateful Dead or whatever is your band may break up after six months and then your yeah. bass drum head is painted and you're like, uh, <laughs> yeah, do you now I got to buy a new bass drum head. New, <laughs> right. You can't really layer more paint on there. So I've yeah. had it where, you know, I was in a band and we did the logo, the let, the, the name in like tape. And now to this mm-hmm. day, I still have some residue of like it <laughs> broke up six years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we actually ghosted on there. Yeah. Little side story. We had an order from a client one time who was in a band in the late 60s and had their logo painted on the drum head. Mm-hmm. And I think it was for one of his birthdays a few years ago. His kid found the original head with a hole in it in the closet. Wow. And our design team here completely redesigned it printed it on a brand new head and gave it to him for Christmas. And it was like, wow. it was a father's it was, day gift. It was a father's yeah. day gift. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. And it was, it was like a reproduction of, you know, like my dad's like high school band, you know, that he, he yeah. like unearthed, you know, in like the basement. And we recreated the look of that That's brand new. Super cool. Yeah, and that was uh, that was a really tough. Oh, that was moment, sweet. Yeah. That came right yeah. on his drum set, and we got. <laughs> wow, and he was so stoked. But it's it's stuff like that. Yeah, where it's like yeah. you couldn't do anything else other than paint it or paint over it if your band broke up and mm-hmm. you know you went to college or whatever happened. And you weren't cool unless you had one, so you had to do yeah, it. Exactly. But then you yeah, were screwed exactly. if it broke up. <laughs> you can yeah, see where the logic going. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a picture that we should talk about kind of quickly, and we'll we'll move along because yes. there's still a bunch to talk about. But the um, uh, Bonzo's kit with the three rings. I mean, that's super iconic. They probably used a stencil or something, but to, to right, paint yeah. circles that cleanly, which even right. if you look at the photo here to explain, everyone knows the three, you know, circles, uh, but it's kind of chipping away a little bit because it's been, yeah, I was going to point know, that out. It's chipping hard. away in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Played hard. And a little fun thing is they cut out a picture of Robert Plant's face and put it on the top of the head above Ludwig. So <laughs> that was a fun little thing, but yeah, it's just to yeah, show that, that cool. even, even on John Bonham's kits, it was painted and they probably did stencil it or do something like that to make the, the rings look as perfect as possible. But yeah, that's, that's all they had. It's chipping off, but yeah. that's all they had. Right. Which is just yeah. absolutely crazy. But we did yeah. have a little side story about the three rings. Of course they picked them out for Led Zeppelin four, but uh, there's also an anecdote from plant that they passed by a billboard in Pittsburgh to see Ballantine beer and the Ballantine beer had the three rings on it. And uh, that's a logo from like the 1800s, too. That was yeah. a sign on the side of a building or whatever. And Interesting. that was and you know, it reminded Bonham of having, you know, condensation from a beer pint glass on a coffee table. Three of them there. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> yeah. You know, wow. Like it to, is the same know, thing. Just a couple flipped. Yeah. Just flipped around. Right. Yeah. And mm. to Bonham's credit, it also just looked like drums and he liked them. So <laughs> yeah. sometimes simple, simple line of thought is the best line of thought. Yeah. You know, but they like at the time when they did this, obviously this was on Let's Up in Four, they were big enough they didn't need the name of the band on there, right? Yeah. You were yeah. Yeah. there to see the band, you knew who they were. But that was the only decoration on stage. Like you said, there weren't backdrops, there weren't any cool set pieces, there weren't but like, you know, any cool like effects. It was just the band with some giant stacks of amps, a cool looking drum set. And they just played their asses off. And his bass drum artwork was the only piece of like art that was on stage. Sure. And, you know, they didn't need anything more than that. But that was the icon that like represented him from the album. So that was his way to put his little fingerprint on there. And, yeah. you know, instead of just having a plain head, you know, and that's yeah. all it was. But then you get into sure. like, you know, like the later 70s and all that kind of stuff. Things changed a little bit, but that was still kind of one of the holdouts of hey i can do this just because i want to not because i i need the branding you know yeah, what i mean yeah. it was just cool you know it, yeah. it transitioned mid 70s more more from the 60s era of psychedelia where everything was colorful hand painted it kind of didn't have to look perfect to ta- kind of transforming into bottoms which is like okay i want these three rings to look clean right yes, clean right it became yeah, more yeah, of yeah. A, a graphic art sort of aspect 
of a logo design than just a painting or artwork. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're getting away from the decorative tidbit of remnant of that with designing these bass drum heads to a more perfected, I want this design on my drum head, which yeah. we'll bring up with Neil and yeah. Rush because he had yeah. a million of those. I know you did a really thorough set of videos with Paul Wells. So everyone, right. please go watch those for his gear because that, that that's a rabbit hole in a Yeah, that yeah, is great. Yeah, that could not be more detailed. Actually, it could be more detailed. At the end, we were like, <laughs> we can talk about the hand fans. And I'm like, Paul, oh, we're done. <laughs> it's six hours. Yeah. No, that's but, enough. But, but we're getting into album artwork as, right. as the, uh, you know, it's, it's each kit, each tour cycle, you'd have that album artwork on right. your head to kind of help promote. So, yes. right. so now we get into sticker development. So let's let's exactly. dive in here. Yeah. 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 And these were, yeah, I mean, like you said, these were kind of a new shift in technology where, like Luke mentioned, like the, you know, the old hand painted stuff was really like laborious. You couldn't get it clean. Now, if we're starting to do like an album cycle and we want to do something that's based on the album, it's got to look exactly right where people notice. And well, hey, let's use this new technology of these like vinyl decals. You know, they were using them on like race cars. You know, they actually, you know, the military developed it for like the Air Force planes and they would have these cut vinyl uh, decals like one color at a time that they would put on there that they could easily like replicate and they could do the whole fleet of, you know, planes at the time Um, instead of having one guy hand paint every single thing like the old, you know, bomber planes with like the bomber girls were hand painted and over time they develop the technology to be able to duplicate that with you know the air force logo and then the the like call letters or whatever they call for the for the plane to like identify yeah, that yeah. plane you know that if it went down or if they saw it like in the sky they knew who the pilot was but they had to be able to make those like uniform across the board yeah the vinyl wow. decals kind of came out of that you know and then you know they started using them a little bit here and there in like the sign industry in like like racing decals, the big like um, racing numbers on stripes the door, you'd see on race like cars, racing yeah. stripes, things like that. When that kind of t- technology kind of started, so of course, you know, musicians adopt all kinds of weird technology and say, "Hey, can oh, I use part. that for what I'm doing?" Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it all starts with the military. I mean, it's like mylar well, yeah. drum heads were like three M, like it was like film. Uh, yep. It was yeah. like the mylar film to like you right. know do re- reconnaissance, and then right. it ends up being like a bass drum head. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. however many yeah. years later, like or a sticker on a head. Yeah, it's. Crazy. And that's it. Yeah. You know, so somebody put together, you know, put, you know, two and two together and said, hey, we can do some really clean artwork. That's exactly the artwork that's on the on the album on this bass drum and we can get it to look exactly right. And guess what? We don't have to pay a guy to sit there and hand paint it perfectly. We can actually go to a specialized sign shop that has this special machine and they can cut it out of a like adhesive like sticker mylar material. Vinyl. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it was just, you know, very similar to, there's still people doing that, you know, uh, right now. I mean, my first heads were these like vinyl decals. So they're, they're still doing that today, but that was a shift in there where this was a, this was a new technology. I mean, it seems yeah. Yeah. weird now, but everything was hand painted and, you know, Luke's got a couple of cool photos with the, the like rush heads that that yeah. was kind of one of the ones that kind of stuck out in our mind of these yes. are really detailed, but they're not hand painted. And they're also a cool finish where they're kind of a, a chrome metallic look or they had that kind of thing where now like lighting starting to come into play here with these shows and a stage show is starting to come out. It's not just, you know, one band everybody flat with no lights and nothing cool now yeah. we're starting to get into like staging with like risers and cool lights and make it look interesting and now let's do some cool stuff where we have you know chrome on the bass drum head why not it looks like stainless steel and you know yeah. make it look interesting yeah. and that's that was kind of like a turning point for the the bass drum heads because now we didn't just have to use paint and it was a flat look now it was you know they could be sparkly we you know the oh, yeah. kiss head is you know one of those but you know we've got a bunch of yeah. um yeah. photos of the different like neil kits that kind of had that same one color yeah. but a little bit cooler and a little sharper and a little more detailed and a little more reflective and you know yeah, for sure. it brought it up a notch you know Yes, it's not the same as hand painting, you know, like like a, a scene of like a you know a boat on a river, but like it is right. still an art to laying out oh, a yeah. huge giant sticker Absolutely. correctly, as we yeah. all know. Everyone has a brother or sister or friend <laughs> who's the one who's good at laying spreading the sticker out and like not getting yep. bubbles. Um, it's a one shot deal. And, it really is a one shot deal. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. some of these rush heads, you can see 
are <laughs> like <laughs> not perfect. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not perfect by any means. The first one is that's actually an Evans Rock heavy duty chrome head. So that was a series of heads that they were doing for a while in the 70s that were built for rock. It was like the first time that drum company manufacturer of heads, cymbals, etc. were making heavier duty stuff to accommodate for rock bands. Yeah, sure. Because people were playing the hell out of stuff and breaking them all the time. So these new heads by Evan were chrome. And it was the first chrome heads of that period. Yeah. So they slapped on a sticker of the black shadow of the Rush logo, which looks great. Yep. Not the best cutting of a porthole up top on that U there, but hey, <laughs> no. can't be, can't all be great. But no. Next ones after that are the Evans Rock blue heads with yep. chrome mylar, and you can see they're just stuck on there. The word Neil and the word Peart aren't necessarily perfectly straight, but they're close enough. They're on. But there. again, right. And now yeah. we got the band name and the drummer name back on there exactly. too, yeah. so we're getting back into that. Especially with like obviously Neil's pull just like gene sure. who was a pull of himself that like i want to go just to see neil you know like the yeah. band's great too but i'm yeah. here to see neil you know and exactly and so now we got a little of both again but yeah like you said they had that chrome effect which was really cool because now with the new stage lighting it kind of lit up a little bit and it had a little bit more you know flair yeah. than the old school p hand painted stuff you know and we yeah. have a, i found this really crazy picture of neil on stage during the uh power windows era and it's a picture of his red kit and there's the decals on the front of his bass drum heads. And it's crazy because this is Rush. This is Neil Peart and it's a sticker. You can see that's a sticker on the left yeah. bass drum head. It's bubbling. Yeah, it's bubbling. And, wow. And like that's so not up to standards now anymore. No. But for Rush no. back then, that was the best they had is just a big sticker on the bass drum head. I, I bet that's all you could do. Larry Allen, who was like his tech, who was doing everything who was right, probably yeah. like all right now let's put this sticker on and yep. he, you know what what do you do i mean you can't it was close it was close but again it's but you guys are specialized in this but imagine i mean we, right. we will give him a break of, of doing oh, yeah. the, whole, oh, yeah. the whole kit oh, yeah. i mean it's well he gets a pass yeah, yeah and you know this this also kind of points out too i mean everybody kind of went from the hand painted into into like the vinyl one color cut decal thing but then there was also a pretty quick shift into printed stickers you know in 70s 80s there too and that's kind of what that photo is and you know to be able to print artwork on a giant sticker that then would go onto the bass drum head was a pretty big technological advancement because again it wasn't just a one color thing you had to nail you know now we're getting into like the 70s and 80s where that printing technology came a little bit further ahead. So now, hey, we can print the album cover on the sticker that, we can't print it on the bass drum head, but at least we can print it on the sticker that then we put on the bass drum head. Yeah. But to your yeah. point too, yeah. you know, there were obviously like a lot of downsides because it's a giant sticker on a head. So, you know, you're you're in these auditoriums, you're under the lights, you know, you're in, you're in a truck, with the drums that aren't babied probably from yep. city to city. Things are going to bubble. Things are going to peel. They play a show in Minnesota. It's hot as hell up on stage that night. And then they put the drums in the truck on the way to Wisconsin. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's 20 <laughs> yeah. below on the way. So then you're getting bubbles and the edges peel and it starts to yeah. flake off. And then they put a little bit of glue or duct tape on there. And, yeah. you know, and they might have to like redo it. Like you said, like, you know, like the drum tech might have had to like redo it two or three times in the yeah. middle of like the tour because it failed and it just ah, this it. looks like crap yeah, yeah just tape it up eh, it'll look fine tonight you know and yeah. like to, to give a to give a year to kind of where this transition starts digital printing really wasn't perfected until about what 1991 when, yeah really when that was when that was really like okay we can print this digital picture onto it something good, right? and it looks good hmm. everything else before that was like screen printing or something of the sort like that right but digital sure. printing really wasn't perfected until the early 90s which yeah at that point it, it, there was the, no digital whole, before that. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And yeah. in terms of culture with musicians, the grunge music became a big thing, and that was anti-glam everything. Yeah, right. Everything from the '80s with Kiss, Motley Crue, Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses, Guns yeah, N' Roses, right. Rush, all that stuff. Like, we're not putting our name on anything. We're going to play our music, and you're going to hear us and know who we are. Or, or yeah. duct tape, or something. Yeah, or duct right. tape. Punk, but like. You know? Also, yeah. huge center cut portholes. There's a picture that we have of uh, Nirvana on SNL. And if, 12 we're, inch set, yeah. if we're playing the same game as the Beatles did on Ed Sullivan, the yeah. band's name is Tama. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, 
that's that's all you get. Otherwise, it's a huge hole and there's a pillow in there. But like, yeah. there's their name isn't anywhere. So it, there was a huge resurgence in the '90s of like, we don't need to put our name on anything. We're just playing our music. A lot of grunge bands did that, like Pearl Jam, Soundgarden. You didn't hear their name. You didn't see their name anywhere on stage because they were just about playing the music, and you knew who they were based on how they sounded. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, it really didn't change until about the early 2000s when digital printing became big. And then this guy jumps into the story with Woodshed. So, well, yeah. yeah. And like the thing, too, is that, I mean, I think people learned when they were having their own, you know, high school bands, like looking up to Nirvana or whatever, you know. Yeah, but we're not Nirvana. We can't do that. We're not on SNL. So we have to <laughs> we have to go back to like the Beatles thing and put our, our name on it or something and maybe make it look cool or whatever. But, you know, then you get back into like the artwork on there, too. And we have to have our name, but make it look cool. But we we're not sure already well known enough to not have our name in front of people like that. I think that kind of, you yeah. know, obviously that's still there, but I think that also kind of died quick because a lot of younger bands figured out that, well, we, yeah, we can't do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not you know? like, it's like lame to have your, your name right. on the bass no. drum head. I mean, no. Nirvana was just kind of like con contrarian to exactly. everything going yes. on yes. in culture where that's yes. the extreme and their Nirvana where they changed right. literally the sound of music uh yeah, right. in the world but it's just like yeah maybe you don't do the huge um i don't know glam rock thing where it's right whatever, however it was presented the art can change but it's yeah. still it's just the it's like saying that like uh people don't put art on canvases anymore that's lame right. we're gonna put it on something <laughs> yeah, completely different right. if that makes sense right. the bass drum head is still just a canvas exactly to absolutely put your art on so absolutely that's still cool yeah yes right and like the neat thing that you know like happened was that like in the early 2000s i mean like we were still doing a lot of like one color logos because logos for bands are mostly one color you know what i mean so we were still doing a lot of like the vinyl decals that were still in like the 70s 80s and then we got into the like printing of the album art or, or printing a full color band uh logo on a giant sticker but that's kind of yeah. what it was and that was i mean obviously you know even with my business too you know like woodshed was doing the same thing too we we kind of like hopped into that game kind of accidentally but you know that's a different story too but we kind of followed the trend of like well okay one color cut vinyl decals you can get at a sign shop we can do that too and then well hey we need a full color thing so then bands were kind of doing that but the really like the digital printing kind of didn't really change much from like you know 80s and 90s all the way up to like 2010s really you know and it was like for that really? yeah for yeah. that you know for that it was kind of like the paint kind of did or like the vinyl decals it was kind of like 20 30 years of the same kind of thing and no one really challenged sure. it too much and everybody did what everybody else did because that's how everybody always did it you know but yeah um it just kind of changed the game a little bit yeah right? let's take it from 2010 and kind of bring it on home to today you guys have done some heads for giant bands. I mean, how, how does this maybe to start here as we as we get close to the end, I guess, how, how does the process work really of like, how do you, you know, maybe explain? I have no idea. Like, do you set yeah. the head and then the machine? How does it work? So the way that we do it now is completely different than how we did it, you know, in the early days of the business. So we're coming up on 25 years next year. Um, just to give you like a little quick background, I, you know, being a drummer and a teacher and, you know, player and stuff, I was kind of in the like necessity place of I needed to, to put my name and the, the band's name on the front of the bass drum head. And, you know, we used what we had at the time. And like I mentioned, we did the vinyl decal thing for a while that kind of turned into like a business um, doing friends bands and friends of friends and that snowballed. And then we did the printed stickers for a long, long, long time. Um, up until what really changed for us was 2010 um, ish, you know, like early, really 2008, 9, 10, we kind of uh, started this like new process that we, you know, I, I found this um, printer that that was able to print onto like the surface of things didn't print onto drum heads. It just printed onto stuff like signs now could be printed you know, on like the board itself instead of, you know, printing a giant sticker and then um, adhering that sticker to the board. Now there was this new printer that came out that was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that basically print 
right on to like the surface of the board for signs. And I happened sure. to come across this thing on like YouTube or something. And I, you know, like my wheels got to spinning after all these hours of putting these like stickers on myself and, you know, having all the labor troubles of like, man, this is hard, man. You do have to nail it, but, man. They don't last forever. And yeah. as a, you know, as like a drummer, I hated that. Like you had to use like certain heads. You couldn't use, you, you know, the things that people maybe don't really think about, like I couldn't use a fiber skin or a coated head because it didn't have the right texture that a sticker would stick to it. I had to use a really smooth head and I couldn't use a head that was too thick because the sticker was thick and it would kill the sound. And I had to kind of keep in my mind how I muffled the drum and how I played the drum and what the batter yeah. head was because now the um, resonant head was way thicker because now I added a sticker on top of it. And, you know, there was all this a lot extra of variables. stuff. variables. A lot of variables and a lot of compromises and always like really bugged me. And then when I got into like recording drums a lot, that was a bigger, way bigger issue, you know? So, you know, kind of cut to what we talked about, about this, this printer, I, I said, why don't we figure out how to do this printing right on the surface of the drum head? No one was doing that at the time. Um, it was a lot of R&D. We've basically figured it out a way to print you know, digital artwork instead of on the sticker um, and then putting that sticker on the head, we could print the artwork in full color right on the surface of the drum head. And that opened so many doors for us and all of our clients because we were then able to use any head that they wanted. We were then able to print their logo on a fiber skin and it didn't change the sound and it didn't change the the look of the fiber skin other than to add the cool logo and you'd get a cool texture. And, you know, there was all these other yeah. cool things that we could then do that like, hey, we don't have to have this big sticker thing anymore. And guess what? It lasts pretty much forever because there's no bubble. Mm. There's no peeling off later. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to crack in the a trailer because it gets cold. We have people coming back from... 10 years ago still using a head they got yeah. like hey i'm wow. ready for a new one that's maybe like, yeah maybe not great for business looking yeah. back yeah. <laughs> great for yeah, drummers but great. you know it maybe lasts a little too long yeah yeah <laughs> but, yeah yeah you know it's like one of those things like yeah they'll uh, they'll last it like the artwork will last as long as the head lasts and how long does like a resonant kick head last like forever right yeah I, so, it's not yeah. supposed to but i've had someone for <laughs> right 15 years so exactly like, yeah. yeah and they yeah. just they just sit there it's fine exactly they're they're so, i'm not yeah, so, they're expensive fine. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you know, to answer your question, we have a, a special printer, you know, here in house that uh, costs more than my house. I'll be honest about that. And it's yep. bigger than a minivan, it's massive. Um, and it actually prints on the surface of the head. So we've got special tooling and things like that that we've kind of worked out to make sure that every head is awesome when it leaves here, that it prints exactly like it looks on screen. And that way, we've got full control over even little stuff like the shade of purple or like the shade of you know a teal that looks exactly like the album cover you know which mm, looks exactly yeah. like what's on our screen and then we can also duplicate yeah. it when they need another one it's easy to print another one and then we also have the control of putting the mic hole exactly where it's supposed to go because we're digitally laying it out you know we've got some really great artists here in-house that design these things you know and we can basically design it or take the logo and kind of like lay it out and then it goes to the print department and it prints right on the surface of the head and they pull it off the printer and they cut the mic hole and it could be out the door that day which is really really cool wow. instead Incredible. of you know the whole labor process of a sticker and all that other stuff yeah so and it's the, the creative control that you have over that now is insane you, oh, yeah. you <laughs> used to be able to just it's if you could paint it you can paint it then it became if you can cut this on vinyl you can do it then it became if this can print digitally you can do it to if you can design it on a computer, you right. can print anything yeah. on this stuff. And I, your I imagination have a few pictures. is the limit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have a few pictures of my personal drum head on my Fives kit that I included in here. It's super uh, cool. It's a great picture. It's Bigfoot with a little baby Bigfoot and a baby Bjorn. It's awesome. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's a smooth white Aquarian head. Like that's a classic clear white head. Wow. All of that texturing we did digitally. All of the the off white coloring, the miscolor discoloration, yeah, the we, aging. We, we, that's a brand new classic clear white Aquarian head that wow. we're able to go in and print and make it look like an old head. And you can do literally anything with this stuff. And as you can see in the, the next few pictures we've got, we've done stuff for a lot of people and literally all sorts of designs that you can think of. And 
Why don't you list off? Because again, I'll show some pictures. But if people are just listening, <laughs> list off some of the, some names of the. Uh, you know, feel free to name drop. Like, what are some yeah. of the big bands and drummers you've done heads for? I mean, over the last twenty four years, I mean, we've you know we've had the opportunity to work with everyone from uh, Kansas to uh, Spring Scene on the E Street Band, you know, and then. Uh, you know, Boston, um, Parliament, Funkadelic. I mean, you know, lots and lots Elton of John. iconic, yeah, artists. Yeah. Uh, Lionel Richie, Elton John, uh, which has been great, you know. And then we also work with a lot of up-and-coming artists that, you know, you don't know who they are now, but then in a, in a month, they're we everywhere. We get there. Though. Yeah, which is really yeah. cool. For me as yeah. a musician, it's it's really cool to get the call to work with Boston or to, or to work with Kansas, who are already massively huge that I grew up listening to. But it's equally cool to be kind of like along the ride for these artists that, you know, we kind of are like along for the ride as as they grow or they they finally get a break and then we kind of grow yeah, with awesome. them. And yeah, and it's fun, you know. And One of our favorites is Bruno Mars. Yeah. Because <laughs> Dom, Dom's known him for that's a great story, over yeah. 10 years. And hmm. we were doing drum heads for him and his brother Eric when they were playing at the Grog Shop on the east side of Cleveland, which wow. is it's a hundred cap, cap club. Yeah, venue. it's a little tiny hundred cap club. You know, they uh, Bruno basically had his first single like he just had his first um solo hit after having a feature hit um with another artist so he was just kind of breaking out and it was their first like real tour um it was you know five guys and two crew guys and like their first bus and everything and they i mean again they're playing at like a hundred cap um little dive club you know in cleveland and everywhere that they could play and uh obviously they put on a you know phenomenal show and things really snowballed from there but um we did a head for that, you know, for that tour. And uh, it was really cool to be able to work with, you know, Bruno and his team who were very hands on because yeah. they didn't really have anybody at the time. But now to still work with them all these years later, you know, f um, about Two five years later, they were like on the Super Bowl <laughs> halftime show. Yeah. Right. So things worked out for him. Things, th <laughs> yeah. things worked out really well. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and then to do like all the Silk Sonic stuff, too, and all that stuff, too. And that was that, you know, those were really cool projects because those artists are really hands on about their aesthetic. And, you know, g going back to what like Luke said, you know, the the whole Silk Sonic kind of vibe that Bruno and like Anderson have this, you know, th like throwback kind of vintage, like yeah. retro vibe. He's extremely careful about that aesthetic being consistent. And they sure. said, look, we're going to try to use all vintage looking gear on stage. We're going to do like the vintage costumes and outfits on stage. All the set pieces are going to be vintage. We do not want this head to look brand new. We want it to look like it was around in 1975 or whatever. Yeah. And we want it to look as aged as you can. And we kind of aged it like we did like Luke. So yeah. it looked really old and beat up like it was just unearthed in a closet. Like yeah. the Father's Day gift that we did. Yeah, you know, exactly. it was like one yeah, of those yeah, things. Yeah. And we're able to do that because we've got the designers in house and we've got the technology to make it look legit as possible. Totally. But we're using the new technology and we're able to use the heads that the drummer specs and he wants to use for sound and we can get the look that they want. And, you know, so it's, it is cool for to be sure. able to work with those guys that like really care about that aesthetic, you know? Yeah. Um, well, they're both we do, drummers. So that, yeah, that they are. And that's yeah. exactly. Yeah. And they, and they get yeah. it. Um, totally. We do a lot of Nashville right now, too. We do quite a lot of, like, Nashville tours and stuff like now, too. So we've done, you know, Taylor Swift and Luke Bryan. Uh, Jason Lander. Aldean was actually one of our first major wow. clients when we started out. He was um, Rich Redman. He was a, he's he's a great friend of mine. He was, you know, basically kind of um, the first real client that we had other than, like, you know, my bands and friends and friends and like uh local bands around the country he was kind of the first big uh touring artist down in nashville that gave us a shot um wow you dom, know dom, just for context dom met him on my <laughs> <laughs> That's, my that's a, in a, a, yeah. a date yes rich was the first person rich redmond was the first person who you know i think i did meet him once or twice at PASIC, but he was the first person to like share a video i put up on instagram to his account really when yeah. I had like 300 followers, now I have 75,000. And uh, it's just yeah. like, I mean, honestly, I think that got me like the first thousand followers was like Rich Redmond yeah. sharing some old vintage drum video I put up. So, so he's, man, he's awesome. He, I owe, you know, thank you to that. Thanks to Rich yeah. for that. Very similar with us too. You know, like he was the guy that said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys a shot, but I'm going to give you feedback. If it sucks, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to help you get it right. And then, you know, when we did end up like nailing it, 
the second or third or fourth time i don't know you know then he was able to say hey i'm going to tell all my friends and that's when things kind of snowballed for us and now we do you know probably 75 percent of our business is down in uh in nashville you know believe it or not so we do all the major tours and stuff now and it's it's super super fun you know i I get to go to lots of shows i get to meet a lot of drummers i get to see these kits up close i get to you know be drum geek with those guys too we got we got a couple pictures to show you that that (laughs) bring it right back to that because uh like we were, he was just at blossom over the weekend seeing dirks bentley mm-hmm. and we like just last friday wrapped up a drum head for him in a premium finish which is really cool wow. and we're we're able to go through and make really cool combinations of techniques that were only available back you know 50 years ago now so there's this picture of the orange sparkle uh dirks bentley kit the gravel and gold head and the drum set is orange glass glitter, and they wanted the gravel and gold print, but they wanted orange sparkle on pinstripe, the drum head yeah. pinstripe. Wow. So we were able to combine a direct print head with die cut orange glitter vinyl Jeez. together to make a 3D sparkle head that, that matched, matched the finish, the finish yeah. of the wow. drum kit. Right. Now you just need some lead paint on it, and you'd have <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. whole, the whole thing I need covered. a nitrocellulose lacquer it, and then mm-hmm. smoke my cigarette while I'm sitting <laughs> yeah, behind exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and then just explode. Uh, exactly. Yeah. But it's yeah. a Man. fun challenge, yeah. I mean, you know, like the guys here love or hate, I don't know, maybe they just tell me they love it, but, you know, we say, hey, we have a cool a cool project, guess what we have to do? And they're like, you have to do what? We have to, oh, we have to, we have to yeah. match what? <laughs> you know, but we yeah. figure out how to figure get it, it to out. look just yeah. right because we're, we kind of see that as we're part of one, we're like one piece of the puzzle on a, on a bigger stage, a bigger piece of the puzzle, and that totally. stage is one piece of a way bigger album, album tour puzzle, uh, you know, and that actually kind of led us into doing all the other cool stuff that we've kind of, branched out into too, you know, backdrops and all these other things that we do for the stage and backstage. But all that kind of started like with the bass drum head and it all kind of ties in. They want things to really match and like have the same kind of look that they're using everywhere else that they're, you know, yeah promoing everything you know yeah, so yeah. it's all cohesive yeah yeah well i would say for people because there is design stage art passes merch festival stuff uh vip yeah. meet and greet go everyone should go to woodshed stage art dot com and check it out because there's we could again talk for another hour about the other stuff you guys do but uh <laughs> yeah. do you want to tell probably. people <laughs> yeah tell people where they can find you on social media and all that good stuff and then they can see you know your your art your work there as well yeah, I mean, we're at uh, we're at Woodshed Stage Art on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you know, find us there at us. You know, we're happy to talk in, you know, DMs and all that kind of stuff, too, about your project. But, yeah, we have a lot of cool stuff on there as well. Give us a ring yeah. on the phone. You'll uh, talk to one of the two of us at some point. Humans. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> human people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, I mean, this is just so awesome. I'm so glad to have had you guys on because this is such a unique topic. But it's it's neat where you guys can, like, Yes, you have incredible, you know, an incredible business that does very, very, you know, uh, premium, like arena level artwork on bass drums. But you also just went through the whole history of the the entire, you know, technology, which, which I think it's cool to know the people who are printing your stuff know that information and are yeah. complete drum nerds like all of us uh, who are, you know, into this type of thing. So absolutely, um, this is awesome. Do you guys want to share your personal, you know, social media accounts and stuff or, you know, you don't have to, but if you want sure. people to follow Woodshed you and mine, keep up so. with you. Yeah, he's, he is at Woodshed Stage on yeah. Instagram. He's got okay. Dominic Tancredi yep. on Facebook. Yeah. I'm uh, Luke Kondrich on Facebook and on Instagram. There's an underscore in one of them. I forget which one. I think it's Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Close enough. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, again, this is these types of episodes are truly like my favorite. I love them all, but it's nice to do six hour Neil Peart episode, but it's also cool to do a nice, uh, you know, hour 20, whatever it ends up being episode, just about one cool, unique, particular topic that I think you rarely hear about elsewhere, uh, which I thank you guys for bringing that here. Um, And before we wrap up, thank you again to uh, David Sagerton, J.D. Sagerton, uh, at D. Sagerton on Instagram. Check out his symbols. Thanks for joining Patreon. If you guys want to join up and get a shout out or get early episodes, there's a bunch of tiers. Go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and help support the show. Um, So anyway, Luke, it was great to meet you in person. Dom, hopefully I can meet you someday in person. And, uh, you know, I'm sure I've probably seen your guys work at a concert 
But uh, someday yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll all be in the same room and, and hang, and, and yes. I, I will likely get merch from you guys um, in the near future for drum history. Awesome. So everyone, keep an eye. Appreciate out for you guys it. We'll being be here. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much.